I'm Sandra Davidson. I'm Dean of the Faculty of the Nursing, uh, Faculty of the Nursing. I can't talk yet this morning. I haven't had my coffee. Um, and we're just thrilled to see you all here. We actually had a waiting list, uh, as some of you might know, for this event. And it's just so wonderful to be back in person. Um, I, I know from the Zoom room there's some familiar uh, uh, frequent, frequent guests that have been with us through through all of our uh, online breakfast series where you have to make your own breakfast um, and it's not quite as much fun so we're thrilled to have you here um, and I would say we're thrilled to be in the McEwen Centre it's a lovely space as well um, and I also want to start, a, start us off in, the, uh, in a good way and acknowledge that the University of Calgary is located in the heart of southern Alberta and we acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7, including the Blackfoot, the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is comprised of the Siksika, Kaini, and Kaina First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspot, and Good Stony First Nations. And we also acknowledge that the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. And it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Don Kingston, our speaker for today. And this is a repeat performance. So some of you that have uh, been attending for a long while, uh, this is our, I think, our very first repeat performance. And so Dr. Kingston uh, presented uh, several years ago when she joined us at several years, so kind, uh, <laughs> as she joined us as a professor at UCalgary Nursing, and I'm delighted that she's here with us today to update all of us on her amazing research progress and achievements. Dawn is the inaugural holder of the Lois Hole Hospital uh, for Women Cross-Provincial Research Chair in Women's Health, Women's Mental Health particularly, and she has worked in maternal health for over 25 years, 13 of those years as a registered nurse in a neonatal intensive <coughs> care, and she was passionate about uh, supporting the families in, in their NICU journey. Uh, she then launched into her master's and studied risk factors that contributed to preterm birth and found that poor maternal health was a significant <coughs> risk. As she progressed through her PhD and postdoctoral fellowship, she had the opportunity to specialize in health services research. She recognized that women's mental health uh, needs were underserved and Canada lagged behind other countries in screening mental health. Throughout her academic career, her HOPE research, which she'll tell you all about, has focused on targeting gaps in women's mental health and service delivery. The work has involved understanding women's mental health needs, identifying mental health risks, and contributing and risks particularly that contribute to poor maternal and child outcomes and developing evaluating and implementing accessible approaches to mental health care for women including the hope platform which you're all about to hear about and most recently her book uh, your brain on pregnancy will be released in september of this year and we may have some advanced uh, wonderful copies and so on a personal note, well, note Dawn is also uh, an advocate of looking after her own mental health. She and, her, she and her husband have two adult sons. And as we were just chatting, she also has 80 heritage sheep, <laughs> uh, 25 chickens, and three dogs. And someday, they hope for grandchildren in the mix. <laughs> Always aspirational, Dawn is. So without further ado, Dawn, please take the podium. Thank you, Dean Davidson, and it's really lovely to be here. And thank you for coming, everyone. And uh, not to disappoint, um, you know, yes, our sheep and our dogs and our chickens are such a heartbeat for us and such a real, such a grounding experience and a good source of mental health. And I have to stop there because I have no filter when it comes to talking about the sheep and I'll just go on and on so we're limited to what's I do want to bring you greetings from the HOPE team and uh, our team, for the most part, has been together since 2012. And fine, fine advocates dedicated to women's mental health. So I do want to bring my greetings from Nikki Roy, who is our research associate, Marie Lane Smith, our research manager, Grace Chung, who does the beautiful work on our website. She's an artist, and so our website really benefits from that. 
here today. We have Corinne Byerling. Can you stand up, Corinne? And uh, Corinne is our clinical neuroscientist on our team. And Afira, uh, who's walking in as we speak. Great timing, Afira. And Afira supports our work with immigrant women and mental health. So that's our team. This morning, what do we want to cover? I'm going to kind of buzz you through our current state of women's mental health, why we need to rethink our current approaches. I want to share with you a new paradigm. We talk about this in the book, but this is really the first time publicly that I'm sharing where we think we need to go and where our team is going. Within that context, I'm going to talk about precision mental health, what it is, why we need it, and give you a brain-based toolkit of five strategies to take home. So by the end of the day, everybody's going to be oh, just like that. <laughs> I mentioned that much of this material is in our new book, Your Brain on Pregnancy. It's coming out, published by Simon & Schuster, coming out in September 2024. And I'll tell you that when your publisher tells you that there's a little bit of a delay for COVID, staffing, <laughs> presidents leaving, things like that, we always go, oh, wow, we should change that in the book. And so, you know, the book has about been transformed many times to allow us to put some of this new stuff in. So we're very grateful that at the end of the day, this is, this is what the book looks like. So... Let's dig into the current state of women's mental health. There are two things I love, sheep and women's mental health, why not combine them? Um, but when I think about women's mental health, I feel like we're like this sheep, and sheep do do this by the way, we're a little stuck. You know, we're stuck at the gate because we are stuck in a current model of women's mental health care, a way of caring for women without looking beyond at other possible solutions that can help us with some of the significant challenges that we face in women's mental health. We've built a medical model for women's mental health. It served us well up to a point, but within the context of current evidence, it no longer feels relevant. It doesn't access the whole breadth of resources that we have available to us. So this was from a paper. I'm going to share with you this medical model. And we have to ask the question, is this the best? This is the picture of the medical model that we follow. We follow it in spe specifically for perinatal mental health as well. We screen, right? And in perinatal mental health, we screen with the end of the postnatal depression scale. We follow that if a woman scores high by a diagnostic evaluation by a psychiatrist so that 18 months down the line she can have a psychiatry visit. At-risk, right? This is reality. At-risk individuals and those with mild to moderate depression or anxiety, well, we can offer them um, psychotherapy if it's available. And then women that are moderate to severe, we recommend that they go on an antidepressant, right? That's the package. That's the full package. And that was outlined very eloquently in an article that just came out a couple of months ago by some colleagues at McMaster University. So this is what we do. If you look at depression in menopause guidelines, let's just sprinkle in other areas of women's mental health. It's the same. Uh, I love this. Whenever symptoms are severe, give antidepressants. If the women's symptoms are relatively mild, give antidepressants. If it's clear that she's in menopause and not transitioning in some other way, give her antidepressants. That's where we're at, right? So what if we were to rethink our current approach to women's mental health, our first line approaches? We basically have two, right? This evidence tells us we have two. We have therapy and we have medication. But what we're doing, in what we're doing, fewer than 20% of women actually get needed mental health care. That alone tells us there's something a bit awry with the system. One out of two pregnant women don't open up to their care providers for fear they'll be put on an antidepressant. This comes from some of the work we did a number of years ago. 
And then a really recent study showed that 50% of women who are taking antidepressants in pregnancy stop cold turkey without proper support of care. And they do that for various reasons. We know it, right? Stigma, harming the baby, they feel crappy, lots of reasons why they do that. And let's think about this. Clinically, first-line approaches, the evidence for first-line approaches isn't really followed. Right? It's subject to what's available. And most of the time, medication becomes our first line approach because we just don't, our waiting lists are too long, we don't have available services. I live in a rural area, you can't find a counselor in a rural area. So often the default is medication. That's just the way it works. We have desperate women desperate providers, and maybe some of you in the room are those providers who want to give women care, but hands are tied by lack of services or wait times, and few resources. So this is the sort of circle that we're in that's driving women's mental health care at this point. I love this quote. It came out in an article in 2022. I think it's striking. This is about the effectiveness of antidepressants, particularly in the prenatal period. Our findings demonstrate that the treatment goal to achieve full resolution of maternal depression symptoms remains a clinical challenge. Despite maintenance treatment, pregnant women with major depressive disorder frequently have residual symptoms at enrollment and throughout pregnancy and postpartum. Specifically, only 18 to 29 percent of the pregnant women in our cohort um, maintained remission. Everybody else still had symptoms. So even with our first-line treatments, not all that effective, right? So I want to open up a new paradigm for women's mental health that really embraces the breadth of evidence that we have before us. These are not new things for Corinne and I. We've been studying this work for a year. They're not new globally. They're just new in Canada. And so this, I want to open this up to you. Women's mental health right now, our goals are really about stabilizing symptoms and reducing harm primarily to the baby in a perinatal situation, right? But the neuroscience model really incorporates the breadth of evidence. It's founded on an evidence base that's been around for over three decades. I know we cannot figure out why we haven't brought this into mental health clinical care. So with women's mental health, we can think about fetal programming. We know about fetal programming, depression, anxiety, stress in pregnancy, wires the baby's brain so that he or she is vulnerable to um, mental health problems down in, in his life course, developmental disorders, etc. Neuroplasticity. We know that neuroplasticity is a thing. You know, we used to think that only babies had plastic brains that could change. But in reality, our brains are able to change throughout our lives. Our brains are meant and designed to self-heal. And then we've got evidence for brain-based interventions, which I'll share. And so the focus in this, what I would call this neuroscience model that our team has developed is really about focusing on the causes, not as much on the triggers, but as on the causes. So let's start, uh, let me, let me uh, take this model apart a little bit for you. Let's start with postpartum. We, we treat women's mental health as silos, right? Most of our resources in women's mental health goes toward the postpartum period with screening and treatment and whatnot. But if you are a woman with, if you are a woman in the postpartum period, uh, your greatest risk factors for getting depression or anxiety in that period are if you had depression or anxiety in pregnancy. The greatest risk of getting depression or anxiety in pregnancy is if you had depression or anxiety pre-pregnancy. The greatest risk of having it pre-pregnancy is if you had it in childhood or adolescence. And oh, by the way, if you've had postpartum depression or anxiety, the chances of it continuing or having it relapse beyond the postpartum period is higher. 
And so although we treat each part of a woman's life as a silo, in reality, they're linked. Oh, sorry, and in pregnancy, we divide that up into three parts as well. We do it, we do it medically. Why are we doing it for mental health? You know, all the evidence shows that depression, anxiety, stress are stable across the prenatal period. Why are we dividing the prenatal period up for mental health as well? It's a mystery. They all have the same risk factors. So they're connected, right? The big, we call, our team calls the, this the big four. Uh, postpartum depression or anxiety, or sorry, previous post, okay, stop postpartum. Mm -hmm. Previous depression or anxiety, stress, partner conflict or trouble, high or low social support. These are always the four same risk factors that come up across these periods. Mm -hmm. So what instead of us saying depression and anxiety in each of these periods, we reframe this where the evidence lies, which is we're actually seeing dysregulation of the brain and nervous system across the life course. Okay, well, what does that look like? The idea of regulation is not new to us. You know, we put babies on mother's chest after birth to regulate their brain and nervous system, to bring their heart rate down, to bring their breathing down. This is not a new concept to us, the idea that our nervous system can be regulated and dysregulated. So what dysregulates our nervous system? What jars it into a state of dysregulation? Well, if we think about dysregulation as being what we talked about, depression, and anxiety, stress, trauma, effects, adjustment disorder, whatever name you want to put in there, it's really anything that makes us feel unsafe or feel like we are in a situation that is inescapable. Yes, that includes abuse. That's one of the first things that comes to our minds, right? But it also includes all these other things. Accidents, car accidents, surgery, having an argument with your partner, grief and loss, feeling alone and unsupported, hurtful comments, not getting a promotion, feeling unheard, not being acknowledged. In his book, um, I'm drawing a total blank on his name now, but he wrote that, uh, sorry, when ze why zebras don't get ulcers. Who is that? Robert Sapolsky. Okay, sorry. No coffee, help me with that one. <laughs> but, you know, he, he, he says in there, you know, when we think about danger in modern society, it's not about the lion chasing the zebra across the savanna. There are social issues that are more, most threatening to us, and you can see that in this list. Not getting a promotion, hurtful comments, feeling, you know, not being heard, these sorts of things. So what is our nervous system designed to do? Let's go for some, you know, neuroscience 101. It's designed to be flexible, right? We experience something that is unnerving. Our, we, our heart rate goes up. We get a little bit anxious. We get a little bit tense. And then we settle down. That's what our nervous system is intended to do. Go through this sort of cyclical escalation. Oh, there's danger. What are you going to do? That's a good thing. But it has to settle down. The problem is, is a lot. In a, in a dysregulated state, we react, but we don't recover. So we never have this nice flow. We just are always escalated. Can you relate to that? There are times in my life I just feel like I cannot come down from this shelf where I'm at. And how does this happen? Because our brain is wired. I say it's like a, a, a lighthouse with a light on. Our brain is wired to be constantly looking for danger. So it's doing a good job. But when it gets dysregulated, it's kind of stuck in danger mode. So what are the signs and symptoms of nervous system dysregulation? Don't they look familiar? Depression, anxiety, fear, worry, high stress, agitation, irritability, trouble sleeping, sleeping too much, exhaustion, fatigue, tension, headaches. GI upset, tummy problems, greater vulnerability to illness, relationship distress, loss of hope, disconnection, isolation. Wow, what a mess, huh? But if we experience these things, our team is suggesting this is dysregulation. This is the picture of dysregulation. 
And look at those four things. There are the big four, the big four risk factors. When we think about dysregulation, we start with the vagus nerve. Uh, how many are familiar with the vagus nerve in your room? Okay. So, vagus nerve, longest cranial nerve in our body, starts behind in our brain stem, moves through, sort of across our ears, down across, across our jugglers, and down into our abdominal organs. Touches almost every abdominal organ that we have. Many of the uh, strategies and professional and home-based strategies that we're going to talk about are effective because they affect the vagus nerve. It has branches, right? It's got a break, a parasympathetic part, and an escalator, the sympathetic part. And what we want is for the parasympathetic part to calm, that calming part to be in control. So I'm going to share a bit more with you. I love this ladder. Deb Dana uh, is a clinical as a clinician, she works with trauma clients quite a bit. But I love this picture. So picture your nervous system as this ladder uh, in the vagus, vagal nervous system in particular. So at the top is ventral vagal. When we're in a ventral vagal state where we feel safe, that's the place we want to always come up to. We feel safe, connected. It's a place of creativity. It's a place, this is how you know you, or you're in the ventral vagal state. You're driving through Starbucks in the morning to get your coffee, and the woman opens the door, opens her little window, and you go, good morning, how are you this morning? That's ventral vagal state. The world is fine, feel connected with everyone, life is good, right? Okay, now let's progress through your day and say that you have a, uh, an argument with your partner. And that kind of drops you down the ladder into that sympathetic state. Your sympathetic part of your nervous system is in charge. You feel a bit danger, you know, in danger because arguments do that to us. They put us in a place of unsafety. We feel mobilized. We want to take action. Fight or flight. That's the fight or flight place. That's familiar to us, isn't it? That's the place where you're going, oh, I, oh, I can't believe you did that. Oh, I, I just want, you know, I'm going to take my wall and So that's the, that's the sympathetic part. That's that middle part of the ladder. Now let's say, carrying on, that your partner doesn't talk to you for four days, just ignores you as if you're not even there. Drops you down into a place, a state of dorsal vagal. That's a life-threatening, as Deb calls it, a, a life-threatening place where we feel immobilized, shut down, collapsed. It's the place of withdrawal and isolation. It's the place where we don't feel hopeful. That's the place where we're saying, he can leave, I don't care. I want to be alone. That's that point. Can you see? And so we go up and down this ladder many, many, many times a day. We can be dorsal vagal at Starbucks, go to the, go in a grocery store, have a rude person talk to us, drop down into our sympathetic system, you know, so what the nervous system is designed, remember that flexibility? We want to be able to go up and down that ladder <clears throat> nicely. And I, and I would call that neurobiological resilience. I think Deb Dana calls it that too. What is resilience? Resilience is the ability to bounce back, yes. But I'm putting a new neurobiological frame on it. Neuro, neuro, um, resilience is the ability to know which state you're in and know how to get yourself back up to that nice, calm place. That's what flexibility is. That's what, um, where we want to be. So, how does all this bring, how can we bring all this into women's mental health? Let's start with dysregulation as our bottom understanding of what's happening. I'm going to introduce you to precision mental health and some brain-based treatments that are evidence-based and some brain-based tools you can take home because if I was a clinician, I would be working both in the realm of professional and these tools, right? We're sending things home with our clients and this, these are some of the things that you can use. I think that this setup will allow us to have optimal brain health for mother and for baby in all of these periods, pre-pregnancy, infertility, pregnancy, postpartum, and in the event of loss and birth trauma believe that this can give optimal brain health for women across their lifespan. 
in areas, not only these areas, but pre and post surgery, grief and loss, menopause, health crises, divorce. And this is where our team is starting to really muck about in farm language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what a boring slide, but I have to do it because I because I, <laughs> it just compares the current model we're in and what I think is promising when we think about a new neuroscience paradigm. So in the medical model, we can't help. We don't want to frame it this way, but it is framed as mental illness. Right? We're ill, we treat with drugs. How about instead of that we talk about brain health? How about we talk about, I experienced some significant things in my life, my nervous system is jarred, now I need to reset my nervous system. How about that? Our first line treatment in the medical model is always medication. First line treatment in a neuroscience are really interventions that are based on the principle of neuroplasticity. There are things we can do to heal the brain. So we think in turn, in this field, in the field of neuroscience, they talk about healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful difference. The medical model is focused on treating the pregnant woman and minimizing harm to the infant, right? But how about if we focus on duly supporting of the optimal brain health of mom and baby, things that have long-lasting consequences. Because the medical model has short-term relief, but when you get into the realm of neuroplasticity and you're changing your brain circuits for the better, that's long-term change. The medical model creates significant decisional conflict for women but for providers as well, right? Because a lot of prenatal providers in particular are not abreast of uh, antidepressants and such in women's mental health. And instead, the neuroscience model, it's non-invasive, non-pharmacological, acceptable. Remember those stats at the beginning, what's sort of problematic about the, mental, the medical model is it drives a lot of women not to share their what they're going through. We cannot help it. So how many times do we have campaigns and we want to get away from this idea of stigma and failure and brokenness, and we can't. It exists in the medical <coughs> model. I think it's like paired with it. But in a neuroscience model, it's linked to hope. Because again, something jarred my nervous system. I didn't have any control over that. I didn't ask for this to happen in my life. But my nervous system is jarred. Now, on that basis, let's go ahead and reset it. Precision mental health plays a part in this. I'm just going to touch on it a little bit. Because this neuroscience model works best when we have screening models that, uh, that point a little bit more specifically to what the problem is. I'm just going to read this. This is a colleague of ours, Dr. Swatsina at the Houston Neuroscience Brain Institute. Each EEG, so this is surrounding EEGs, <coughs> biomarker suggests underlying brain dysregulation, which may explain why prior medication attempts have failed. The EEG biomarkers cannot be identified based on current psychiatric assessment methods, which is largely symptoms from the DSM, right? The EEG biomarker identification approach can be a positive step toward personalized medicine in psychiatry furthering the clinical thinking of testing the organ we're trying to treat, right? When we treat the heart, we scan the heart. When we treat the brain, Dr. Swatsina would say, why aren't we scanning the brain? Now, when I first looked at this, I thought, well, that'll never happen. You know, we live, we're, we're in I mean, Canada. You can't find an EEG. But the reality is they're actually pretty cheap. They're cost effective. And you know what, with training, the same people that are doing screening can do an EEG. It's not that hard. It's a cap mm -hmm. with sensors plugged into a thing. It's not that hard. Takes about 20, 30 minutes. Takes that long to screen. The um, Edinburgh Postnatal Depression screen takes four minutes to do and 16 minutes to talk about. And it provides objective data to treatment. Let me give you an idea of some of these brain-based bottom-up interventions that are of the professional 
uh, resort, neurofeedback, biofeedback, vibroacoustic stimulation like Tomata's safe and sound protocol, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, brain spotting. These techniques are bottom up because they are affecting the brain and the benefits are coming out of that versus talking therapy, not bad by the way, it's just hitting a different thing. It's hitting our prefrontal cortex. It cannot touch the innermost parts of our brain that are actually triggering stress, depression, anxiety, trauma, and whatnot. So neurofeedback has been used for lots and lots of different things. Similar to an EEG, it's like a cap with sensors. The woman sits back in a lovely chair, darkened room, watches a movie. That's neurofeedback. What's not to like about that? What, what, what woman wouldn't like that, right? Oh, you could get your Starbucks too on the way. Um, but neurofeedback has been used very successfully. ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, concussions, depression, anxiety, insomnia, migraines, PTSD, seizures. There's evidence around that. So why aren't we doing that? There's evidence. This is the whole thing. Why do we have like a bag of 30 year old evidence that we don't use? What is wrong with this picture? Tomatis, safe and sound protocol, our listening protocols, vibroacoustic stimulation. The idea is, you know, uh, certain particular frequencies. It's not music therapy, it's not just lovely, calming music. It's using particular filtered frequencies that vibrate that eardrum which, oh, by the way, is really close to where the vagus nerve goes, presses the vagus nerve, helps, her, helps us to feel calm, right? And these are not long treatments. They're like for neurofeedback, 20 hours? It's not long. Oh, are you ready? You have to memorize this. <laughs> I'm just demonstrating that there's evidence on these techniques. We just have not brought them forward into maternal mental health. And I think what, what our team has, has really considered is if this stuff is working in an autistic child, turning this child's life around so that they're attending school, regular school, how come we can't back that up into pregnancy? And why are we withholding that from, other, from across women's lives? Is there room for talking therapies? Absolutely. There's always room for compassionate companioning. And one would hope that, you know, in the course of neurofeedback and all these other things that we are using, compassionate companioning is our, as that environment around our neurobiological techniques. And should, so the question really is, should it be first line? I don't think it should be. I think that we should do the brain work first, can people build women's capacity to then respond to therapies in a way, you know, why do we need therapy? Well, we have behaviors, right? Sometimes we, we have relationship behaviors that we're used to, defensive behaviors and whatnot. Well, fixing our brains makes us have capacity then to be able to work through these things. Are you ready for your brain-based toolkit? How are we doing for time? Are we good? How much, how much time do we have? It's, it's uh, ten minutes. four minutes. Yeah, we have to put 10 minutes left. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. I'm going to introduce you to something that we float in the book. It's called the B Protocol. Um, it's basically breathing ears and eyes. That's what B stands for. Then I'm going to share with you music at specific frequencies and specifically a harpist called Steve Rees. So I'm just going to introduce you to five ways that when you are down that ladder, either in the sympathetic state or in that dorsal vagal state, you, you identify that you're there, you can use these techniques to start to get yourself back up to a vag ventral vagal state. We can't stop the fact that we go up and down, right? What we want to stop is actually going down and not knowing how to get back up. So this is the way up, to the, la up the ladder. So, uh, this is Alpha, sorry, he was the first one on the farm, but I just think this looks like he's breathing, so close your eyes, and let me just close your eyes, and I'll, and I'll walk you through the breathing part. I know you're going to go, breathing, we've been doing that forever, but here's the thing, breathing presses on the vagus nerve, which runs through your abdomen, right, 
And that's why breathing works. So, you know what? It's always a first line thing because you can do it in a meeting. Don't need to close your eyes in the meeting, but you can do it in the meeting. You can do it driving anywhere. So, close your eyes. I'm going to walk you through this. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're just going to do four breaths in through your nose. We're going to hold that for four, and then we're going to go, to, we're going to go out for six through your mouth. That's all we're going to do. And what you're going to do is make sure you do that gross thing where you push your belly right out when you take those breaths in. So let's just try that. So let's breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Exhale through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, and breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. That's it. So I almost hate to say, we're going to breathe because, yeah, see, we're, we've been doing that, right? We tell our patients to do that. But it is part of this protocol because it actually has a neurobiological mechanism. Now you know that. Okay. I'm going to show you, we'll move on through the uh, ears and eyes. I'm going to do the ears first. So this is very simple. Uh, you could probably do this in a meeting, but see what you think. Uh, so you just take your finger and you put it in your ear. Again, we're putting it in the place where the vagus nerve comes very close. Putting it above the shelf, that little shelf of cartilage. Got it there? And you're going to move it in a circle clockwise. And you're going to do that 25 times. Do you think you could do that in a meeting? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but 25 times. And the idea is, again, you're putting some pressure, compressing the vagus nerve, which runs very close to that part. And then after you've done your 25 times, you would do it the other. Put your finger above that cartilage 25 times clockwise. And that's ears, OK? And then your eyes do not do this in a meeting, and do not do this while you're driving. But, um, I'll show you what we're going to do and then get you to do it. Okay, so the eyes, we're going to just take our hands, clasp them. But can you hear me okay when I back like this? Um, behind your, your head, and you're going to, this is lovely, done lying down with your knees bent on the floor. It's very nice doing it this way. Again, don't do that in the meeting. Uh, <laughs> But the idea is to look straight ahead. That's your neutral position. And then we're going to move our eyes as far over as we can to one side. So I'm going to look to the left, far left. And you would hold there. You can count out 20 or 30 seconds. And then you bring your eyes back to center, back to neutral for 10 seconds. And then you move to the right for 20 or 30 seconds. And that's the process. You can do that for like five minutes. You know what I mean? You're just doing that sequence for five minutes. Now, what they say, I'm, I'm giving you a time, 20 or 30 seconds, but they also will say, um, for that exercise, keep looking until you do unladylike things like belch, <laughs> yawn, because these are heavy sigh, because those are releases of the vagus nerve. That's how they sort of manifest in our bodies. Yeah. So now you've got your breathing, ears and eyes, right? Fun, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also sing or hum because the vagus nerve actually comes down and innervates the pharynx and the larynx. And so when you, well, you can gargle too, but you know, that's kind of anti gargle. Does anybody hear gargle? Maybe just when you're sick? Um, anyway. But humming or singing will have the same effect on the vagus nerve, um, stimulating the vagus nerve, sending the signal to your brain that all is well, and you can stand down. And then the final strategy, number five, that I want to share with you is uh, harp music. And so uh, there was a really lovely article um, that show the benefit of music therapy or music for the mom and babies. But again, what we're really talking about when we think about neurobiological vibroacoustic stimulation is specific frequencies. 
Steve Reese is a man who was a nurse, decided to play harp, did harp therapy, but has discovered particular frequencies. And this is, he's not alone in this. There are researchers around the world that are looking at what are the frequencies that are calming? What are the frequencies that have certain functions for us? And uh, so I just want to give you, hopefully, that will, will it, will it do it? Oh, yay, look. <laughs> An example. He has all kinds of YouTube videos, but you can do this while you're while you're working. Lovely. into harp music in particular and frequencies and um, the benefit of that. So, oops, there we go. So now you've got your picnic basket full of five strategies that you can take home. If I was a clinician, I would be giving these as homework <laughs> for my clients, right? The B protocol, breathing, eyes, ears, sing, hum, harp music. None of these things are hard, right? None of these things are hard and they feel too simple. They are simple, but they're powerful. Now you know what they do. Just some other resources that we have as well. The Hope uh, Mental Health for Women.com is a Hope is our platform, our digital mental health platform. Some of this material will start to be floating up into that. Um, so that it's public available. This is available free. It was sort of the focus of our early research, our past 10 years of research in our team. Um, and now we're just, we're, we're going to be using this platform to disseminate some of this research and evidence and ways that women can continue to help themselves and to start the conversation about can we talk about brain health instead of mental health? Of course, your brain on pregnancy, and I think after Q&A, there's a bit of a surprise, some giveaways. Um, and then we have a website again. Thank you, Grace, for a, always a beautiful website. All these have free resources in them, so yeah. And on behalf of the HOPE team, I want to thank you for coming today and for uh, really letting us talk about what's been on our hearts for a year and to share it publicly. And thank you for nodding. That's been very <laughs> encouraging along the way to know that, the, that this is landing and resonating with you. So thank you very much. Have a few minutes for questions and answers uh, if you're game for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so please, yes. There. Um, I would be curious to know what your um, thoughts are on tapping technique. Tapping, mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, Sharon, where are you? Sharon. Sharon's a clinician.